The Limburg Brothers, months from the très riches heures du Duc de Berry, 1400s. The très riches heures, or very rich hours, is an illuminated manuscript, which means that it is a book containing handwritten text that is also illuminated or illustrated with miniature representational paintings or decorative motifs. It is called a book of hours because it features prayers written in Latin for various designated hours of the day. It has 206 pages of a very fine, high-quality parchment called vellum. The book measures about 12 inches high by 8.5 inches wide. Its copious and lavish illustration with expensive pigments and gold leaf indicates that it was a very luxurious item. The main illustrations of the manuscript were begun around 1412 in France by the Dutch miniature painters the Limburg brothers, Hermann, Paul, and Johan, for Jean, Duc de Berry, who was brother to the French king Charles V, and at the time the manuscript was made, uncle to his successor Charles VI. One of Jean's other brothers, Philippe the Bold, was Duke of Burgundy, at whose court the Limburg brothers also worked. The Très Riches Heures, like other manuscripts of its type, opens with 12 pages of miniature painting depicting the months of the year and an astrological calendar overhead. The upper portion features representations of the signs of the zodiac that correspond to that month, as well as a central image of a figure in a chariot pulling the sun, an allusion to pagan mythology in this very Christian society. The larger lower portion contains scenes from everyday life that feature activities appropriate to each month of the year, while also revealing the stark contrast between the charmed, sumptuous life of the nobility and the hard, austere life of the peasants. In fact, you will note that one of the themes of the work is labor versus leisure. The Limburg brothers and their patron all died in 1416, possibly due to the plague, and the work was thus left unfinished. The unfinished part seemed to have included the months, and art historians have detected a slight change in style where either new illustrations were created for November and possibly October and December, or existing ones were further elaborated probably March and September, and maybe October and December. Some scholars have determined that the first editions were likely executed in the 1430s or 1440s, under the aegis of René, Duc d'Anjou. It is impossible to determine with certainty who the artist was, but he is called the Master of the Shadows, due to his tendency to include shadows that would be absent in the Limburg Brothers' work. Because shadows are a very marked feature of the miniatures of Barthélemy Dyck, many art historians attribute the work to him. His spatial awareness was greater than that of his predecessors as well. The manuscript was not brought to its final state until the late 1480s, when the painter Jean Colombe worked on it for the Duke of Savoie. It is unclear whether Colombe, rather than an anonymous painter in the 1440s, was responsible for the aforementioned months with stylistic differences, but specialists have yet to offer a conclusive attribution. The manuscript has been housed in the Musée Condé in Chantilly since the mid-19th century. Our focus will be on the representational scenes, some more than others, as some of the greatest examples of the art of the 1400s, and particularly of a style known as the International Gothic, which is the last medieval style before a full transition to the Renaissance. Due to the rapid development in art in this century, we will already see some changes between the earlier International Gothic works and those completed later in the century. Returning to the 1410s, we can begin our tour of the months with January. The month of January depicts the New Year's exchanging of gifts among nobles who are safe and warm in the Grand Hall of the Chateau of the Duc de Berry. The Duke is represented in blue at a richly laden banquet table. He is turned in profile to welcome guests. The same word is written twice to his upper left. 
This is like the dialogue bubble we see in comic strips. It says, approach, approach. Court attendants pour wine and cut the small fowl. At first glance, the grand hall appears to be open with a group of knights charging forward in the background. However, a tapestry representing the Trojan War hangs on the back wall. The month of February features the first known snowscape in Western art. It takes us from the warm coziness of the chateau to an outlying countryside farm where peasants alternatively try to keep warm at the fire or continue with their labors despite the cold, snowy weather. The work is full of descriptive details. A protective fence encloses the sheep shed whose roof is pierced by a hole on one side. The sheep huddle together for warmth while pigeons feed in the foreground. Barrels, bundles of twigs, and a two-wheeled cart further fill up the enclosure. A figure steps into the yard from the right, pulling a drape tightly around himself and perhaps blowing into his hands and shivering with cold. His pink shirt often causes viewers to mistake him for a woman, but if you look carefully in the upcoming images, women always wear garments that fall well below the knees. Inside the enclosure in the background on the right is the dovecote, which would contain pigeonholes for pigeons and doves to nest. As we saw in the previous image, these fowl provided an important source of food in medieval Europe, but were also kept for their eggs and dung. Between the dovecote and a tree are a series of beehives. Outside of the enclosure works a woodcutter in the act of chopping off small branches. Bundles of twigs, attesting to his labor, surround him. To his left, behind the farm buildings, is a snow-covered haystack. And beyond that, a peasant transports supplies to the village on his donkey in the distance. As with all medieval villages, the church spire rises above the other buildings. Returning to the farmhouse in the foreground, we find a cutaway wall, a convention of the International Gothic that enables us to view a building's interior. There, people warm themselves by the fire. Closest to us, in rather refined clothing, is a woman who daintily lifts her skirts. A cat lolls on the floor beside her, and some kind of laundry hangs on a rod above her. In a further back room, a pair of servants or perhaps younger individuals likewise hold their hands up to the fire for warmth. They have more carelessly opened their legs and hiked up their skirts in such a manner as to expose their genitals to the viewer, a touch of humor on the part of the painter. The depiction of the genitals seems fairly deliberate, for if they were drawn correctly, their midsections would be hidden under their robes, not pushed down towards their knees. Beyond them, there is a receiving space with perspectival lines on the bed cover as well as the steeply sloping ceiling. On the back wall, past the bed, more laundry, adding a touch of color, hangs below a pair of small windows. Rational space and perspective are a bit haphazard throughout the image. There is definitely an awareness of how to make a box-like shape appear to recede in space, but it lacks consistency. And this inconsistency occurs not just within individual architectural structures, but within the picture overall. For example, the artist clearly understands that the figures should shrink as they recede in space, but they don't always diminish coherently with respect to one another and with respect to the architecture. Let's take the woodcutter, for example. He's nearly the same height as the figure in front of him, which might not be a problem, but the architecture in the foreground has diminished at a much more exaggerated scale. Thus, he is too tall for the dovecote, and he's much too tall for the back of the sheep pen and buildings that are supposed to be at virtually the same distance from the viewer as the dovecote. And yet, he's almost the right size, just a bit too large to fit comfortably into the back room and the bed, visible in the cutaway house. While the exaggerated recession of the foreground elements poses a challenge for the reconstruction of an actual perspective, especially since the objects inside the enclosure feature an exaggeration that the enclosure itself, being the same height in the back as in the front, does not, the size of the woodcutter should probably be much smaller, even smaller than the man with the donkey behind him. 
These discrepancies with regard to naturalism do not dampen our appreciation of the work, which beautifully evokes the chill of a snowy winter day. Despite the perspectival problems, the artist has achieved a strong sense of deep atmospheric space through the combination of better scaling of the background buildings and aerial perspective. Besides the cluster around the church spire, another hamlet is perched on an even more distant hill in the background. They are painted in the way our eyes would see them, less distinct in the distance. This desaturation of color, slight fuzziness to outlines, and lack of detail defines aerial perspective. The smoke coming out of the chimney naturalistically dissolves into the atmosphere. The prominence of white with a light gray tonality, delicately infusing or delicately infused by the images blues, pinks, and browns, provides a strong sense of atmospheric unity overall and makes the color palette of this image the most gently harmonious of all the calendar images. The fore and mid-ground figures were the most saturated colors, drawing our attention to them. By March, the winter is coming to an end. The peasants prepare the fields for another year's crops. In the foreground, a white-bearded plowman guides a two-wheeled plow with its cutting blade and a team of two steers. In the vineyards, the workers cut the vine stock, removing last year's dead shoots. A little monument in the front marks the edge of the fields, but the exaggerated perspective makes the structures at the far ends of the field look unnaturally shrunk down, especially in comparison to the larger shepherd who is supposed to be even farther afield. The location is in the region of Poitou, with the non-extant Chateau de Lusignan, one of the Duc de Berry's favorite residences, in the background. Above the tower on the right, a dragon evokes the fairy Melusine, a freshwater spirit whose body is rendered as a serpent or fish, and sometimes with wings or two tails. According to legend, some of the noble families of France were descended from her. By April, spring has arrived. It is the season of rebirth, mating, and flowering. Romance is also budding, and we may have a depiction of a specific engagement between Bonne d'Armagnac, the granddaughter of the Duc de Berry, and the Duke Charles d'Orléans, nephew of King Charles VI and future poet. Bonne and Charles exchange rings before witnesses. Two young women pick flowers. The fruit trees start to blossom within the enclosure, rendered with a highly dubious, tilted perspective. The scaling is inconsistent once again, with groupings of the exact same types of trees, really a generic stylization, rendered at scales entirely independent from one another. The particularly late Gothic stylization of the figures is also quite evident here, with the figures rendered at an elegant eight and a half heads high, about one head higher than average, with attenuated limbs. The long flowing drapery adds to the graceful appearance of the elongated, slender bodies beneath. The protruding bellies of the noblewomen further add to the swaying, curving elegance of the figures. While it may look like the woman is pregnant, if you look carefully at the woman gathering flowers, other noble women throughout this series, and other idealized paintings of women from this time, you'll discover that the bulb-like rounding of the belly is a pictorial convention. This time, the castle in the background seems to be the fortress of Dourdan in the Orge Valley, not very far to the south of Paris. The following month, when spring is in full bloom, begins on the 1st with May Day. A riding party heads out into the forest. Musicians with long horns lead the way, announcing the festivities. The nobles wear leaf crowns. At the front of the group, wearing red, white, and black, is Jean de Bourbon, son-in-law of the Duc de Berry. Behind him, the women wear long green dresses, the color of May. They have the same attenuated, doll-like elegance of the ladies in the previous image. Beyond the trees is a sumptuous residence, which may be the Palais de la Cité in Paris. 
The whimsical Gothic style often rejects the stabilizing regularity of Renaissance pictorial approaches, but this image emphasizes the horizontal more than any other thus far. Even so, there is an enlivening, rhythmic irregularity to the loosely defined horizontal bands, and the foliage and dense trunks of the rather schematic but nonetheless effective and pictorially engaging trees disclose a rich textured patterning with subtle but vivifying variations within their repeated forms. The arrangement of the foreground group forms a subtle arc, although the horns of the trumpeters, at intersecting diagonals, shoot the eye upwards then across the topmost band before rejoining the top of the arc at the right. The upward surge at left also accentuates the movement of the rearing horse below them, and creates a sense of forward momentum. June brings us back to the fields, worked by the peasants. It is the time for haymaking. The women in the foreground rake the hay into little stacks. The men, in light summer clothing, cut the grass, and the repetition of their same movement creates a sense of rhythm. We are beyond the banks of the Seine River in Paris, and Saint-Chapelle is visible among the buildings on the Ile de la Cité. We're back to a more obviously dubious perspective, but the formal elements of the composition are no less pleasing for it. July is the first full month of summer. A stream bordered by reeds cuts diagonally across the fields in the foreground again with a tilted perspective and scaling problems. To the right, a pair of peasants shear the sheep. On the other side of the stream, the harvesters cut the wheat with their scythes. They hold a stick to set the stalks upright again. The field is full of blue cornflowers and red poppies and surrounded by willow. The scene unfolds in front of the triangular castle of Poitiers, it should be noted that the Duc de Berry had other titles, including Duke of Auvergne and Count of Poitiers and Montpensier. You can see the long wooden drawbridge that gives entry to the castle. In August, the Duc de Berry appears again, this time on a grey horse with a maiden. The party is enjoying a favorite pastime of the nobility, falconry, which refers to the hunting of small animals with the help of a trained bird of prey. Leading the group is the falconer, the expert who has trained and now flies the falcon. The accompanying dogs will gather the prey. August offers a rare depiction of nobles and peasants together in one scene, though not occupying the same space. On the far banks of the river, in the fields, the peasants load the sheaves of hay onto a wagon pulled by two horses. The heat of the deep summer incites men to disrobe and bathe in the river. We'll try to overlook the perspectival problems that make the field workers too large for the castle behind them, in the distance. It is another one of the Duc de Berry's properties, the Chateau des Tempes. As noted earlier, the month of September is often attributed, at least in part, to a later artist, whether the Master of Shadows in the 1440s or Colombe in the 1480s. The stouter appearance of the peasants in the foreground, their shadows, the strong horizontal orientation of pictorial elements, and the much more accurate perspectival space all attest to a stylistic change in a different hand. The subject is the harvest of grapes for the year's vintage. The peasants rather happily busy themselves in the vineyards, including what may be a pregnant woman. One of the young men tastes the grapes. Another bends over, showing us his bottom in his underwear. Such an attention to modesty, as in the peasants from February and the swimmers in August, bespeaks the class differences separating the refined nobles from the coarse country bumpkins. Of course, the hard-working peasants lived an earthy existence that had neither the time nor the means to overconcern themselves with matters of delicacy and refinement. Wagons are ready to receive the bunches of grapes. In the background rises the Chateau de Saumur, which belonged to René, the Duke of Anjou, who seems to have been the patron of the Très Richeseur after the Duc de Berry. 
The month of October has an even more strongly horizontal format. It also strikes a more somber note, in part due to the predominant brownish-gray tonality of the picture. One peasant, in tattered clothes and with a somewhat melancholic expression, scatters seeds, while another harrows the soil on a horse. A scarecrow, in the form of an archer, does not ward off the birds. But the month of October is also famous because it depicts the Louvre, a stronghold that had been recently converted into a royal residence under Charles V. The vast complex that houses the museum today would be again expanded and embellished, so that only the foundations of the building represented in this image can be seen in the museum's subterranean passages today. The month of November offers the strongest stylistic break with the rest of the illustrations. It portrays a peasant who is using his stick to make the acorns fall from the oak trees. His pigs are gobbling them down. They offer an important source of nutrition at this time of year. The mountainous landscape has not been decisively identified, but evokes the region of Savoie, birthplace of the painter Jean Colombe. In fact, this is the one month that is unequivocally attributed to Colomb. As noted earlier, strong advances with regard to naturalism occurred in the 1400s. The understanding of perspective has improved, and thus the scaling is more accurate throughout. The men in the forest are already much smaller than the men in the foreground, and they are much smaller than the trees. We understand that they would diminish in scale as they move farther away and would easily fit into the chateau. The sense of space is clear and rational throughout the image, and we even have mountains in the far distance. In order to convey this deep atmospheric space or sense of farness, Colombe has employed aerial perspective, an artistic technique that mimics reality, which is to say the effects observed with the naked eye. Aerial perspective, or atmospheric perspective, refers to the way distant colors become desaturated, even to the point of a monochrome blue. Analogous to this, the sky lightens to a far less saturated blue, even a white, at the horizon. Meanwhile, forms are less distinct, sharp, and focused, meaning we should perceive fewer details and the overall effect might be hazy, fuzzy, or blurry. The month of December brings us to the end of another year. It represents a hunting scene where dogs have made the kill and devour a wild boar. The men, the veneur and the sonneur, carry stakes to finish off the wild animals. There is a kind of brutal realism to the scene. The composition is simple but satisfying, based on a few regular geometric shapes. One can identify the Chateau of Vincennes, constructed by King Charles V during the Hundred Years' War on the site of a smaller royal residence where the Duc de Berry was born. Its keep, or dungeon tower, remains the highest in Europe. In addition to the theme of labor versus leisure and the cyclical nature of time through the months and seasons, the work bespeaks the importance of nature and the earth, which is the vital source of life for all, rich or poor. Cultivated fields and farms provide the basic source of food and clothing. We have also seen how the forest offers sustenance through hunting, acorn production, and firewood. Whatever place one held in the social hierarchy, the bounty of nature went hand in hand with the need to protect oneself and shelter from the elements, like excessive cold and heat or storms. The magnificent castles attest to the political unsettledness and constant warfare of the era, but their magnificence meant little without the labor and productivity of the land.